As I said earlier, so excited for this week's preview to be joined by the great Hall of Famer, one of the best play-by-play guys in history. Is that is that all the bullet points you sent me, Sean? Uh, and thank you for reading yeah. that just as yeah. I wrote it out for you. That's thank perfect you. so far. But the don't awesome... stop while you're on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> the awesome Sean McDonough, uh, kind enough to join us this week. I, wa- I wanted to get him on for a couple of reasons. Uh, part one, just to assess the college football season at this point. Part two, he's done it before, but getting the unique assignment of calling the game of your alma mater who just happens to be having a good season to this point. So Sean, first of all, th- thanks for hopping on with us. My pleasure. Always good to be with you, my friend. It's a little bit better on a golf course, but we can settle for zoom. Yeah. Well, like zoom, zoom is kind of the new thing. Like people got so lazy once zoom became a thing, right? It's like, Oh, you want to have a meeting zoom. You want whatever happened to a conference call. Well, that's also true, but at least this way we can see each other. Right. And- that's true. Yeah, on the conference call, you know, like if you ask me annoying questions, now <laughs> I'm going to have to hide my disdain for you. Whereas on a conference call, I can kind of go, Jake, what's that? <laughs> no one would know. But uh, just, didn't just don't be the like guy where you think you're muted. Don't be the guy where you think you're muted and you're unmuted. That, <laughs> that could ruin a conference call immediately. All right, I digress. I could ruin some careers too <laughs> on these Zooms from <laughs> stories that we have probably both heard and read. Now, now we're going down a dangerous path, you and I. Let's get back to the, the fairway, as it were, in football. Week seven was an all-timer because of the matchups that you had. Where do you think we are right now, big picture, after the chaos we saw in week seven? Well, it was great. You know, uh, obviously the Alabama-Tennessee game was the headliner. Never have I done a game that I thought was as exciting as the one I did Saturday and had the feeling of dread that there probably aren't many people watching this. You know, we had Oklahoma State and TCU, which was a great overtime game between two teams ranked in the top 13. So, you know, it was a great weekend all the way around uh, for college football. I think it sets us up for a great second half. You know, I, I still think, you know, the teams that you kind of, traditionally expect to be there in the college football playoff era are there Mm -hmm. Alabama as Nick Saban made it a point to point out very quickly after they lost you know still has kind of everything ahead of it you know they went out they're going to be in the playoff so they're certainly not out of it you know Clemson who we have on uh on Saturday I think has already played the hardest part of its schedule now they play an undefeated Syracuse team too but you know they've already played Wake Forest and NC State and Florida State so you know, they've played a lot of the best teams in the ACC already. I think they're in great shape, especially if they get by this weekend, uh, to be in the playoffs. So as much as we like to think, well, it's sort of open, uh, it's really not that open. Yeah, I mean, bring, talk about that because you did have TCU Oklahoma State, which at one point it was a blowout, 24-7, TCU comes storming back. Is TCU – in this thing are they legit based on what you saw because they're kind of that one team that's on the outside that people aren't really talking about much i i think they are legit because i think the big 12 is really good so i think if they keep winning uh you know they're going to have an excellent strength of schedule i mean we were talking to the two coaches this past week coach gundy and coach dykes about the big 12 i mean kansas was picked to finish 10th in their league and they're a really good team. There's no easy outs in that league. So, you know, I think if they continue to win, I'm not sure that a one loss TCU team would get in. Obviously a lot of it depends on what else happens. Although last year we did the big 12 championship game, uh, Todd Blackledge and Molly McGrath and myself and, you know, Oklahoma state had one loss and there was a lot of talk as we were doing the game that if they won, that game against Baylor, they probably would have been the fourth team in and maybe undefeated Cincinnati would have been out. So who knows, you yeah. know, the way it all plays out. But but I, I do think that uh, the Big 12 is sufficiently strong that if TCU could get there with no losses or one loss, uh, they'd have a great chance. You know, and so I think they're people. talented enough to do that. It, you know, it's, they, it's they have a good too. team. That's a legit team. The Max Duggan story in and of itself, wouldn't a starting quarterback to start the year, it seems to be a perfect marriage with Sonny Dykes. I mean, there's so many stories out there. Even Kansas State – who TCU has this weekend has been a good story with Chris Kleiman and Adrian Martinez coming in from Nebraska. So we're never short on storylines in this sport, which is a segue to Syracuse this week, taking on Clemson. I I mean, let's go to the game first. I don't know that many people had the orange undefeated at this point of the season. No, I think I read one of our wonderful bits of information that comes from our stats and information group that, 
there was only a 38 percent chance when the year started that Syracuse would win six games for the year. Right. Never mind, you know, be six and oh, the, the schedule was pretty favorable. But they also, you know, I think when you're a program where Syracuse is right now, I know you had Dino Babers on SportsCenter, and you're trying to have that year, you know, you got to win kind of all the 50-50 games that look like that going in. And they beat Louisville to start the year, very convincing. They beat Purdue in a, in a close game that uh, it helped that Purdue kind of had a meltdown at the end of the game with some penalties that uh, certainly helped. They didn't play particularly well against Virginia, but they won the game. And all those games were at home. So, the schedule has been very, very favorable to them, to their credit. They've defeated everybody. But from here on in, it's Clemson, Notre Dame, at Pittsburgh, Florida State, at Wake Forest, at Boston College. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. So, you know, very nice to get to 6-0. and uh, But, you know, you look at the rest of it, and I haven't talked to our FPI people, whoever they are. But, <laughs> you know, I would think Syracuse will actually be an underdog in several of those games, uh, maybe most of those games that I just listed off. Yeah, the, the one that stands out, Boston College, they should win. Maybe Florida State, based on what's going on with Norvell and that team. But I would agree with you. that yeah. Notre Dame, I mean, Notre Dame's beatable. Yeah. I mean, if you can lose at home to Marshall and Stanford, no offense to those two programs, <laughs> uh, you can certainly lose inside the fabulous uh, JMA Wireless Dome or whatever we're calling it now. It has a great uh, ring to it, doesn't it? Oh, I see what you did there. Yeah, it's a great company, local company. Appreciate their support of Syracuse University, but it'll always be the Carrier Dome to some of us who were there on opening night in the Carrier Dome. Oh, what night was that? That was fall of 1980, my freshman year on campus. The Carrier Dome opened, and the the funniest part about the whole deal, it was a great night, a very exciting night for somebody like me who was on campus for about three days, but the Carrier Dome, named for an air conditioning company, had no air conditioning, and it was about 140 degrees inside the dome. They just added air conditioning within the last year or two. I don't know if you ever did a game up there early in the year, but it, it's sweltering hot, or at least it was before they uh, added the air conditioning. But now it's climate controlled. So post-carrier sponsorship is when they got the AC in? Yeah, kind of weird, but yeah, yeah, that was the timing of it. Look, when you look at it's a great home court field advantage for Syracuse. Babers talked about it on SportsCenter. We've had the good fortune of, of being here at home. He also said he didn't mind being at noon in a place like Clemson that historically can get loud. And if you're going to go to a road environment like that, perhaps if you're Syracuse, you're thinking, well, it's a nooner. Maybe they won't be as hydrated as typical. Maybe there'll be some late arrivals. It it sets up okay, better than night, right? Oh, yeah, I think so. You know, there's a little history there, too. I mean, if you'll recall Syracuse won up in the Dome in 17, and then our group did the game in 18 when it was uh, Trevor Lawrence's first game as the quarterback, you know, Kelly Bryant had quit the team earlier in the week when he found out he was no longer being the starter. They were going to put this freshman in very talented freshman. He got hurt. I believe it was in the second quarter. Yeah. They put, they put Chase Bryce in Syracuse. You know, it looked like they might win the game. I think they were ahead until the final minute and a half or two minutes. I think they kind of wore out on defense, but Chase Bryce, it looked like when they first put him in the game, they didn't even want him to throw a pass. And he looked like maybe he didn't want to throw a pass either. <laughs> and then they had a fourth and nine, I think it was, and he threw a rocket to the side, a beautiful wow. throw. I mean, uh, that was probably the key play of their whole season. So, you know, I think Syracuse as a program believes they can compete. Last year, I believe it was 17-14, even though Clemson had a down year. So, you know, th- there have been some close games. Yeah, I was surprised uh, – that Syracuse is only a 14 point underdog and not to no offense to them. Yeah. I just don't think they've really proven it yet uh, against the opponent of this caliber. And you got a Clemson team that has the longest winning streak in the country, the longest home winning streak uh, tied for the longest in the history of the ACC and uh, that playing really well. I mean, last year, Matt, when they were four and three, you know, they, uh, they were averaging 20 points per game. And in one of those, they scored 49. So, I mean, this year they've scored 30 points or more in every game. They, they yeah. are dramatically different on offense. It isn't just DJ. It's the offensive line. It's the running back, Shipley, having a terrific year. So, I think they're a, a legit, you know, college football playoff team. With, with, with Babers, I find when you – we know this more than anybody that in this sport that we cover, you get a quick hook if you're a coach. If you're not winning, you're two, you're three, they're, they're going to hook you. 
I had mentioned the Babers today. I didn't get into the details of it, but he went from that nine and three season to the pandemic, I believe one and 11 and then five and seven. Mm -hmm. The fact that he's even still here to be able to continue this reclamation project to me is something very rare nowadays in college football. Well, you shortchanged them by one. He, they won, they went 10 and three in 18. All right. My fault. Uh, No, no worries. (laughs) Um, But that's when he got, you know, that's what happened. You have the big year. He became kind of a hot name. Syracuse gave him a, a long-term extension. And then, you know, it, it didn't go well. It hasn't gone well since uh, until this year. So I think part of it was the patience on the part of the board of trustees, Chancellor Siverud, John Wildhack, our athletic director at Syracuse. Um, but I think part of it was just the reality of he has this contract that we're not really in position to, uh, to get out. So, and I think everybody wants him to succeed. It's yeah. not like he's a bad guy. We can't get, you know, I think everybody loves Dino, right? I mean, you talk to him today. He's a very likable guy. He's an interesting guy. You know, he's had an interesting background. Um, so I'm glad that they're having the year uh, that he's having. He said in his interview with you, he thinks this is now kind of the beginning of an extended run of mm-hmm. good seasons like this. You know, people, they were really disappointed when they had that 10-win season. I remember – uh, being there in 19, uh, early in the year when they played Clemson and, you know, the place was sold out and this is going to, here we go. And then they had a five and seven season when uh, I think optimism was really high. So, you, you know, you, I think the, the goal now is to kind of string a few of these together, but I think at the very least he's, uh, he's earned himself more years. Yeah. I'll That's get you out here on this one because you've been gracious with your time because you're, as I said, in my long list of superlatives you sent me, you're a consummate pro when you're calling <laughs> these games. This isn't the first time you've called a Syracuse game, but you're passionate about your school as I'm passionate about my school back here. And it's a unique perspective to be able to go to an alma mater, which you were called the game of your alma mater, that you know in and out. How do you balance John McDonough, the fan, and Sean McDonough, the Hall of Fame broadcaster, when you're calling a game? Well, you know, I'm not going to lie, and I'm sure, you know, you've experienced this in your, in your – I don't know, have you ever done an Arizona State game? I have game? not, no. They yeah, don't well, that'll be the true test. <laughs> you know, it's not easy. Um, and yet, it, it sort of is, because I'm sure you find in the games that you do – and you're a terrific play-by-play person, by the way, in your own right. Oh, I, I love uh, – well, Yeah, I've said that to you before, but it's true. The um, – you know, the – I think you get so focused on what you're doing when you're calling the game mm-hmm. because there's so much going on. You know, we people think we just stand up there and watch the game. And, you know, and I say to friends of mine, the friends of mine say, tough job. You only work three, three hours a week. You know, it's like, <laughs> okay, come do the preparation with me. Right. You know, and uh, we'll talk about that and watch all the films and talk to all the players and read all this stuff. You know, it's a week long job, as you know, but you're not, it's almost like you don't have enough, attention span you don't have enough energy to expend on the fan part uh because um you know you're so focused on just doing the job and you know we owe it to the people who are watching to call it straight down the middle it's hard there are times you know sometimes i've done syracuse basketball games i've done a lot more issue basketball games than football games in recent years you know i find myself trying too hard to go the other way you know like oh make sure i sound excited when the other guys score um but an example from the game down there when Syracuse almost won, uh, that was a, one of the best games I've ever done, not just because it was Syracuse, but it was just a great game. Um, Syracuse late in the game got a uh, on a key play where they're going for it. I believe it was on fourth down. They got it, and they had an ineligible man downfield penalty. And, yes, the fan, Sean McDonough, was really not happy about it. <laughs> but in my head, I'm saying, you know, what would you say – if this wasn't Syracuse right. and I would still have said, I think it's baloney in it because as you know, you can call that, especially in this age of RPOs on almost every play, every time to right. throw it at the end of the game on a key fourth down with the team going for a big upset, you know, on the other team's home, you know, but I tempered what I said just to avoid the, Oh, he's only saying that because he's a Syracuse person. He's biased. I love Syracuse, love Syracuse would never hide it. Um, but uh, it's our job to be fair and impartial. And I love Clemson. <laughs> you know, really yeah. do. We've done, you know, Davos, awesome. The people there are great. We've done a lot of Clemson games. Uh, I think they probably only lost one game that I've ever done. 
uh, at Pittsburgh last year when they were in that four and three uh, start. Sorry to keep rambling, but because uh, I know you're trying to get me out of here on this, and apparently no, I know you've got to stay. No, 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 but, you've it, but got, it, it is difficult. But you know, I and it is, you know, when it's other teams, I never have to think. Uh oh, don't react emotionally to that because people are going to think you have a bias. Um, when it's Syracuse, you do have to run that thought through your mind. Is this really how you feel, or is this the fan part of you kind of getting a little too carried away? And it's funny, even when you're calling games and the limited games I've called, people think no matter what, you're leaning one way. You, I, I could have zero huh. connection to the Which university. Is so, right, to anybody who's watching this, we don't care. I we don't, don't care. The greatest thing was, and I'm not on Twitter, but the greatest thing was uh, during the NHL finals, having an equal number of people on social media say, I was biased against the Rangers and I was biased against the Tampa Bay Lightning. That's in beautiful. The, uh, in the Eastern Conference final and the same thing in the Stanley Cup final. So I guess when an equal number of people on both sides are think you're biased against their team, you're actually uh, right down the middle where you want to be. You've exactly done your job at that point. So noon Eastern, ABC, the University of Phoenix of Central New York. Take it on. <laughs> Take the it on Harvard Twitter. of Central New York, which I should patent, by the way. I, I believe I'm the first person who said that, and I'm still the, the most common practitioner of it. It's a wonderful school. Uh, you know, you jab the Syracuse weather when you talk to Dino. Not every place is Tempe, Arizona, as, wow. we, as we both know. But, uh, <laughs> but the weather in Syracuse isn't really much different than most other places in the Northeast and the Midwest and other places where it gets cold and snowy. And uh, it's an awesome place. And I'm excited to have the opportunity to do the game. I should also warn you, since you're not on Twitter, it was going around this week. I think it was seven year happy anniversary to Michigan yes. state, Michigan. Is that set? Is that right? Yeah. So your, your 2015. Call all, yeah. Your Michigan, call was all Michigan over the state. internet this week. Yeah. He because... has trouble with the snap. Um, yeah. yeah. Amazing. You know, be around long enough you might get lucky enough to be around when something like that happens you know if you ask me matt what was the rest of the game like i mean obviously it was a close game because yeah. the game switched on the last play of the game which team won but there wasn't a ton that was memorable about it but you know even if you're not a, a spartan or wolverine you're going to remember that and i still have people particularly michigan state people walk up to me in airports or wherever and say you know Listen to this, and it's my call was their ringtone on their phone or something like that, or their voicemail message when you get their voicemail. So, yeah, the Sparties, uh, they all love that. And to the Michigan people, I've always said, don't kill the messenger, right? We, it wasn't our fault. We would have been just as excited and said it in the same way if it was the other way around. So it's just what happens. But we're awfully lucky when we wind up in a situation like that where there's a game like that and an ending like that. We were lucky enough for you to share our time with us today on the, uh, was it week eight already? Week eight preview of college football here on the ESPN College Football YouTube channel. Have a great call this weekend. We'll be watching. Uh, maybe you'll have one of those uh, memorable moments again, and maybe it'll be in favor of the other Orange team. Who knows? Well, you know, I, I just hope what we hope for every game, right? You hope for a close game. You know, our, our group, it's only the mid part of the season. Our group, including the one last week, has already had three overtime games. Uh, so the others have been kind of one-sided. So it's, we, you know, maybe we're due for something that's sort of close, but, uh, but not a seat squirmer like we've had. But, but we're hoping for another good game. I think what Dino said to you is true. You know, I think, obviously, they're not the more talented team. Syracuse Clemson has a wagon, as they always do. They've done a remarkable job in recruiting. But I think Syracuse is good enough to hang in there and make it a game at the end. And if they can do that, then you never know what might happen. We all win, you win. Sean, appreciate your time, buddy. Always my pleasure, my friend. We'll see you down the road. We'll see you through the television, but not this weekend, because you'll be doing your magnificent job on ESPN. We'll be talking to Kevin Ooh, Nagandi. And, and we don't like you cut in, guys, because you're always trying to take our people away to some other game. Ooh, like even the other day, <laughs> Kevin keeps it. Here's another highlight from Alabama and Tennessee. All right, Kevin, we know. And you know what? It's on CBS. <laughs> The whole goal here is to keep people watching one of our games. Yeah, we get it. It's an all timer, and you're trying to. St how about what have you about that four box when you're like, hey, here's what's going on these oh, games? Oh, <laughs> we had like a minute and a half to go the other day, right? It's this wild game going down the end. Well, here's the you know, the box, and it was four games. No offense to the four games. So here's what's starting up now. None of them were exactly of major interest to people around the country, 
you know, they were probably of interest if you were a fan of one of those schools. But I'm like, really? With a minute to go in this game with two undefeated teams? Or, by the way, here's the menu. So, you know what? I'm going to put this on you, Matt Barry. You know, I'm use not- some of your leadership. And every now and then, I know when people are in the studio, everybody in the studio thinks the studio is the most important thing. And we're out there on the game. We all think that's the most important thing. But maybe we can use a little judgment and just tell them, maybe this isn't the time to do our four box trying to uh, set up the app. Maybe we can wait until this overtime is over. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.